Uh, today, we are delighted to have Professor Yan Man as our, our speaker. Dr. Yan is a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Alberta. He is a magnetospheric physics researcher with interest, interest in radiation belt and substar dynamics, serving as a co-investigator on the NASA Van Allen probes and TAMIS missions. He is especially interested in the utilization of data from networks of ground-based magnetometers. After spending five years as the PI of the UK SunNet Array, he moved to Canada in 2003 and has served as a PI of the Charisma Magnetometer Array there for nearly 18 years. He was a founding member of the Ultra Large Terrestrial International Magnetometer Array, the Ultima Consortium, having previously served, served as its chair. He is currently the chair of the United Nations Expert Group on Space Weather. And just three days ago, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Soci Society of Canada. Congratulations. So before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. So please keep your mic on mute and you can post, post your questions on the chat box. I will read them after the, the presentation. So yeah, please, Professor Ian, you can start. Okay, thank you, Marcos. Thank you for the introduction. And um, I'll rely on uh, the hosts there to let me know if my uh, audio is not working. So I'm hoping you can hear me just fine. So just to say yes. thank you to, um, to, to Kyle and David and uh, all of the colleagues responsible for this um, seminar series. I think it's a great service to our community. So I want to express my personal thanks to you for, uh, for organizing this uh, service to the community during these uh, challenging times. I think it's uh, much appreciated and, and also thanks to you for, for the invitation. Um, so I suppose I wanna start with a word of warning. So I'm gonna talk about uh, use of ground-based magnetometer data and the material I'm gonna present is a, a selection of some things that I think are interesting at the moment. So ne necessarily this is not a review of the whole field and so emissions are entirely my fault. And I've just selectively picked something, some recent research from myself and my collaborators and some other things that I think maybe uh, might be of broader interest to the, to the community. So let me start with some um, kind of scoping perspective here. So here's a image that I've stolen from NASA uh, indicating the challenge, I guess, for people working with ground magnetometer data, how, how to, uh, understand and diagnose this complex solar terrestrial interaction from the surface of the planet. And, um, you know, the advantage that we have is the accessibility of the surface of the Earth for deployment of said instruments. And so that's really going to be the focus of the presentation here is how to exploit that advantage of um, meso and global scale perspective, albeit from, from the surface of the planet looking up. So, you know, if you want to kind of think about this, here's the magnetosphere in a, a schematic representation, sometimes quietly perturbed by the solar wind and other times, um, you know, disturbed more violently from eruptions on the surface of the, the sun. So how can we combine data from the ground to remote sense some of these dynamics and figure out uh, what's going on? And one of the advantages that, that I'm going to really emphasize throughout this talk is that the guided nature of alphenic disturbances in this system bring signatures from three-dimensional geospace down towards the ionosphere. And then the currents that flow in the ionosphere allow us to piece together a picture of what's going on under some appropriate um, assumptions. So... I guess the philosophy that I've followed over a number of years is to try to combine that global data coverage or mesoscale data coverage with in situ measurements from satellites. And here's a nice uh, movie that Andy Kale from the University of Alberta put together. And so this is probably quite a nice representation of the stimulation of a standing alphane wave by the solar wind. 
and geosynchronous and cluster and other vehicles in the vicinity of various parts of this large three-dimensional space. But the problem, as you can even see just in this representation, is that um, the sampling is at best sparse. And so we have to work with what we have available to us at this moment. And so I'm going to show you some examples of combining in situ measurements of the plasma dynamics with remote sensing from the ground, in particular from Themis and the Van Allen probes. So I guess maybe in the future, and I suppose there's some missions in phase A study right now looking to bring constellation class measurements into this three-dimensional space. Um, maybe a magnetospheric constellation mission will eventually be constituted, but right now um, those uh, constellation missions are not yet reality. And uh, even if they're constituted, I believe that the ground will provide important information about how the disturbances in space coupled to the ionosphere and down. So I guess there is one constellation I wanted to mention because um, Brian Anderson and Colin Waters uh, uh, might be upset with me if I, I don't, is uh, beautiful measurements from, from the Ampere constellation in low Earth orbit. And so I think this is a, a nice bellwether for what can be done um, with these measurements, but um, they're using you know, ADCS magnetometer, uh, measurements with limited resolution, um, but, but fantastic global coverage. So I guess I want to take one step below that and ask the question, what can be done underneath with ground-based um, measurements? And as I've mentioned philosophically, one can think about these current systems and waves and disturbances that exist in the magnetosphere, that we know that they're coupled by field aligned current systems or by alphanic wave disturbances down to the lower altitudes of geospace, down into the ionosphere, where currents close uh, and perturbations are to some degree mapped by disturbances that are uh, alphanic. And so I took this uh, nice illustration from John Coxon's 2014 paper. I like it quite a lot in terms of kind of understanding how the Dungy cycle and um, field line current systems can map down close to the earth to allow the philosophy of using ground measurements to, uh, to drive science advance. So this is the kind of picture that one can imagine. And this is a schematic from the SuperMag Consortium. Jesper Gerlov is the PI. And this uh, SuperMag Consortium looks to bring data from uh, as many magnetometer arrays as are willing to give them their data for distribution into a common data plot. So just look at the number of dots that exist um, around the globe. Of course, somebody like me would say, well, you probably still need more, but um, look, looks pretty good in terms of the coverage that's available um, in North uh, and even Latin America uh, and in Western Europe uh, and kind of distributed at lower densities throughout the, the globe. So this is a pretty unique, in my view, resource that we can use to probe the um, solar terrestrial interaction. And uh, for a long time, this Ultima Consortium, which is a collection of um, partnering ground magnetometer PIs, currently chaired by Peter Chi, has been trying to promote this philosophy of um, bringing the arrays closer together. And I'm going to use uh, one specific array for some of the examples I'm going to present here. And that is an array very close to my heart. It was mentioned in the introduction, the Charisma array of which I've been the PI since 2003. So this is a, a network in uh, Western Canada, principally spanning from the polar cap all the way down through the auroral zone and the plasma sphere uh, and below, and uh, currently constituted even with some stations uh, in the Northern US. And these are Fluxgate instruments, principally. Um, the resolutions are sub uh, 0.1 nanotesla in resolution. And the standard data products are, you know, a second or two second data sets from the flux gates. And we're running a sub network of induction coils at 100 samples a second with Pika Tesla resolution. And so, you know, I um, believe and hope to demonstrate to you that networks of this kind can be a very powerful tool for um, scientific discovery. And there's details on the website at charisma.ca. So, uh, I've set myself a, a bit of a broad task. And so I'm going to try to step through a few examples of how to use ground data and how ground data has recently been used to look at a number of important geospace phenomena. So 
I love waves. Anybody that's met me knows that I love waves. And so I'm going to start talking a little bit about uh, ultra low frequency, large scale disturbances in this coupled system, and then kind of walk through some applications of the energetics of those waves and how they're connected to disturbances in the system. So I'm going to use substorms as one example, and then talk about the potential role for wave particle interactions in the radiation belts and the ring current. And if I have any time left, then I'll mention briefly the kind of other end of this wave philosophy, which instead of using waves to diagnose dynamics, is to invert the problem and to use the properties of the waves as they propagate through the medium as a way to remote sense the properties of that medium. And, you know, I guess uh, that might be called sort of magneto seismology. And you can do uh, elements of that using these ground networks. So let me talk about the ULF wave, ultra low frequency wave injection into the magnetosphere. So these are large scale disturbances that could be excited by the solar wind by impulses or by shear flow along the magnetopause boundary. And I wonder if, um, let me see if uh, you guys can see this on Zoom. If I go to a laser pointer, is that visible? Yes. It is, okay, perfect. So um, I guess there's been some recent interest in energy injection through these wave um, characteristics. So in addition to the Dungy cycle that I mentioned earlier, the, the, of course, very important injection of energy through magnetic reconnection on the day side, um, that can also, of course, result in wave disturbances. Um, but more direct injection of uh, low frequency and ultra low frequency energy can occur from the solar wind into this system, including direct kind of impacts from solar wind structures, as well as the shear flows that can develop along the magnetopause. And Hasegawa has a nice paper about wrapped up uh, Kelvin Helmholtz vortices in nature from 2004. Um, now, I guess the characteristics of that interaction are interesting for um, energy and mass and momentum transport at the, the magnetopause, although I'm not going to focus on that aspect here today. What I am going to focus on a little bit is the idea of how wave energy might be injected into this system. So if you smack the magnetosphere here, you can excite compressional magnetoacoustic modes that can propagate in the system. Uh, the outer magnetosphere behaves a bit like a waveguide, and so waves can propagate inwards, refract, bounce off the magnetopause, and kind of make their way dispersing down the tail um, in the form of a waveguide. And the characteristics of the boundary are very important. Does the energy leak out, or can we constrain and contain that energy inside the geospace system close to the Earth? And something of, of interest to me is whether this boundary can be uh, an energizer for these global disturbances, extracting energy from the flow and depositing it, it, depositing it into a disturbance in the magnetosphere. So surface waves are well known, of course, at these kind of shear flow boundaries. Um, but more recently, some work has shown that uh, the same um, Maxwell stresses at the boundary can energize global propagating modes and deposit energy into large scale uh, disturbances, compressional disturbances, which bring energy deep into the magnetosphere. And we can see those waves and that coupling in action with networks of ground-based magnetometers, not just as a function of latitude, as those field lines reach different distances, but also as a function of MLT or longitude from the ground. And to use this global coverage as a way to sense what's happening out there um, in the outer magnetosphere. So here's a, a schematic picture from a sort of different perspective of what's going on in terms of external excitation. Um, perhaps these Kelvin Helmholtz disturbances, they injecting energy into the system. And if they have a frequency that coincides with a natural standing alpha frequency on one field line, then one produces this characteristic behavior known as field line resonance. So a standing alphavenic mode reflected from the two ionospheres is resonantly excited at a, 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 a location here, perhaps in the outer magnetosphere, by an incoming and possibly reflecting and standing uh, mode in the outer magnetosphere. And in fact, many characteristic wave disturbances that we see obey this paradigm within this system. 
And so it's an important mechanism through which energy is being processed. I'm going to talk a little bit later about wave particle interactions. Um, so these waves, when they're excited, can affect um, drifting particle populations, perhaps energizing them. Or alternatively, there is a mechanism for energy to go in the opposite direction from energetic particle distributions into the waves. I'm not going to focus on that kind of direction of energy transport today too much. I'm going to focus more on if we excite these waves, um, what can that energy do if it's redistributed amongst energetic uh, particle populations? And if you think that this energetics might not be too important for the overall system, let's say compared to the Dungey cycle energetics and magnetic reconnection, um, I, I think uh, that's not really true. Uh, and so Jonathan Ray published a nice paper back in 2007 where they were estimating ionospheric dual heating inputs from waves like this. And, you know, they estimated that the, the wave energy deposition might be a significant fraction of that released from a store tail in a substorm cycle. So it's certainly an important, in my view, element of, uh, of magnetospheric dynamics that, that sometimes um, perhaps I won't say ignored, but maybe underestimated in terms of its importance. So here's a, a nice example from a network of ground magnetometers um, from within the Charisma array, um, the array formerly known as Canopus, um, set up by Gordon Rostocker and colleagues, John Sampson and others in, in Canada um, some years ago, starting around 1989, I believe, was the first deployments. So these are th uh, stations along the so-called Churchill line on the um, western uh, side of the Great Lakes. And basically, you can see along the western shore of Hudson's Bay, these stations go upwards in latitude like this. And you can see these kind of fairly monochromatic disturbances as a function of time over three hours of universal time. And you can see that the amplitudes are peaking at this Gillam station in Manitoba um, with a nice envelope and a fairly monochromatic uh, signature. And if one analyzes the amplitude and the phase as a function of latitude, you get this classic resonance signature where there's an amplitude peak where whatever the coherent driver is, perhaps a waveguide mode that's exciting these disturbances, uh, resonates with the natural frequency of a field line at this latitude. And then the amplitudes decay on either side as the field lines have frequencies higher or lower. And then the phase change through that resonance is, um, you know, the order of 180 degrees or even more as the disturbances phase mix once the, the driver has, uh, has disappeared. And one can measure the uh, latitudinal and longitudinal characteristics of these waves with networks of ground magnetometers uh, and analyze how they work. And one of the interesting things you can do with this data is because some of these disturbances are very monochromatic, you can play follow the energy a little bit by looking, for example, for modulations of energetic particle populations with these characteristic frequencies and use that to probe some of the uh, dynamical processes that are operating. Now, just as a, a, a brief aside, I'm going to talk about uh, substorms, and I've mentioned about some of the energetics of ULF waves. And so I wanted just to show a couple of slides from recent work by Stavros uh, Dimitrakoudis uh, in our group, looking at whether convection, especially on the flanks of the magnetosphere, can be associated with large magnetic fluctuations and large DBDT. And why would you care about that? Well, maybe there's strong energy transport, but if you're interested in space weather effects, these large DBDTs, if they close in the ionosphere, could generate DBDT on the ground. So many people are focused on substorms and the night side as a large driver of uh, GICs in the power grid from substorm dynamics and from space weather. Um, but this work suggests, and I'll show a couple of slides, that the flanks might be an under-recognized important region for um, space weather effects in the power grid. And this actually is quite consistent with a really nice paper that Mervyn Freeman and colleagues published uh, last year in Space Weather, where they looked at the historic disturbances from UK magnetometers and found actually that the largest DBDTs were observed 
in the biggest space weather events on the flanks at mid latitudes and not actually in the kind of midnight local time sector. And I believe that the explanation for that is a, an importance for, for convection in driving disturbances which close in the ionosphere and drive large DBDT on the ground, which we can of course see with our magnetometer arrays. So here's a, an example from a paper of Stavros's that's in preparation. And so he took data from these stations from around the world, um, some of my favorite stations from Charisma, and then augmented them by stations from a number of other arrays to give you kind of a, 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 a great circle. And this is the March 2015 storm. And so here's 24 hours of data uh, on the right from these stations. And just to explain what's happening here, so the, the gray coloration is a representation of the local night side rotating with universal time. And the blue shaded regions are periods during the storm when the IMF was southward. And so you can see some evidence of organization by the southward IMF, which is maybe not too surprising. Um, but what you see here, for example, if you look at the Canadian stations, um, uh, around the flank here, you can see very large fluctuating disturbances. And I've not seen this reported in the literature anywhere. That there's a large bay develops, it bangs around with hundreds, if not thousands of nanoteslas of disturbance, and then relaxes back again. And it seems to be confined to certainly a UT time, but also to some extent to a local time around the flanks. There's some evidence of this um, uh, kind of in the night side sector. And then there's some evidence of it picking up again um, um, when these stations again rotate around uh, 12 hours later onto the flank in the Asian sector. So these appear to be not really substorm related. They appear to be associated with flank disturbances, strong convection. And um, in the initial comparison we've done to MHD modeling, they don't appear in the large scale, for example, LFM models of this storm. So the physics, whatever it is, doesn't appear to be well captured, at least in my opinion, as yet in those models. And that's something that we're actively trying to understand. And just to show you a kind of a zoom here in line plots, I don't know if you can see this here, but um, if you look at the disturbance here, this is the Fort Smith station. You can see this very characteristic fluctuating disturbance that's confined to maybe um, an hour and a half or so of uh, time, at least in the frame of these uh, rotating magnetometers. And there's actually a really nice uh, tool that Jesper Gerlov and the SuperMag team have put together. And so I pulled this as one of their archive plots for this particular storm. And I'm gonna see if I can um, play this movie here. Um, and so what you see is the earth rotating and data from some magnetometers. And you'll see kind of some activations develop, especially on this flank um, at the time of the disturbances that I showed you previously. So here's some kind of like um, night side disturbances, but you can see there's large disturbances developing on the flanks. The arrows are delta B fluctuations. I guess I should say the lines are delta B fluctuations in the magnetometers. And then these circles are period um, labeled by color amplitude of waves. And so here you can see huge disturbances developing on the flanks in this kind of 13 to 14, 30 UT interval that I showed you in the earlier slide in terms of the ground magnetometers. Maybe I can just play this again as I'm talking, but um, huge, huge disturbances of uh, ULF waves and large DBDT that appear to be confined um, to the flanks. There's some signatures of aurora associated with that. The full physics of this are not known at this moment, at least not to me. Um, but I think that they're probably related to disturbances, um, possibly instabilities associated with strong convection shears, maybe connected to the magnetopause uh, and the interface to region one currents. Um, but the details need to be um, worked out. You're gonna watch this go crazy again in a moment here. There we go. So 
this gives you, I guess, a snapshot of maybe the power of some of these ground networks for starting to visualize the disturbance fields that exist. There's obviously huge complexity in this system, but that also means that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, keep ourselves busy in research and trying to, to explain uh, all of this beautiful behavior. So let me change tack a little bit uh, and talk about the substorm. And of course, this has been a, a topic of active study and debate in our community for many decades, um, characterized by energy storage in the magneto tail during the uh, growth phase, and then the violent release of that energy expansion phase onset, um, and then the recovery phase as the system settles back down to normal, perhaps waiting for more southward IMF to store additional flux in the tail during the next uh, growth phase, as nicely kind of explained by Bob McFerrin in his paper back in 1973. And of course, this was the, the, the focus of the Themis mission to place uh, five spacecraft at different distances in the tail, at least in the initial science phase, and to try to establish the connections between the disturbances at different distances in the tail um, with their projection on the ground, both in terms of an all-sky camera network and, uh, and magnetometers. And so, you know, Vasilis Angelopoulos and his team, this is a schematic from Vasilis's science paper in 2008, have made great progress with these platforms and the ground array to try to piece together uh, how this system is um, powered. But there's lots of questions that remain, especially around the dynamics in this kind of near Earth transition region, whether it's perturbed by inward flows or by local instabilities. Um, the characteristics of the disturbances that couple to the ionosphere here, in my opinion, remain fascinating and not fully understood and worthy of, of future study. And so what I want to do is to show some examples of how one can use ground data to start to probe some of this dynamics. So this is the kind of pre-Themis paradigm. Um, is the substorm instigated? from a reconnection disturbance in the midtail in the so-called outside to in paradigm uh, that uh, flows in and then couples to the near earth dynamics that go down um, to the ground or is there more of an inside to out disturbance? So there's some current disruption or ballooning or other disturbance in this transition region. And that, that couples to, to the ionosphere and destabilizes the, the tail. I don't think this has worked out. Clearly, reconnection is an important driver of this system, but I would say I'm kind of agnostic almost um, about whether ULF waves and other uh, ground monitoring can tell you uh, about what's happening in this region, uh, because it can, and maybe it uh, reveals to us interesting dynamics, somewhat agnostic to um, where this thing begins. Um, but in general, what are the physics of these near Earth processes, either under tail reconnection driving or under other perhaps uh, more local instability processes or a coupling between those things that brings the, the tail um, sequence of events, let's say, uh, into such a state that it can explain Akasufu's auroral sequence on the ground. So let me show um, somewhat gratuitously here um, the uh, nice movie from the, the Themis team kind of justifying the, the dynamics um, with the in situ probes and then how that can be combined uh, in terms of these tail dynamics with what we see in the substorm sequence on the ground optically. So this is a set of uh, cameras, white, white light cameras uh, from the Themis array and then a zoom in here. And so what you'll see is some development of some arcs in this region. You can see this arc moving southward, some activations. And then actually you'll see a substorm try to go off in a sort of pseudo breakup around here. I don't know if you can see my pointer um, around there. It doesn't quite get going. Uh, and then the substorm itself goes the second time lucky. And then there's the release of the substorm uh, current wedge, westward traveling surge, and the disturbance of all of these uh, nice substorm dynamics. And you can see in this example that the uh, most equatorward arc is where that uh, explosive release of energy appears, at least from the perspective of the ionosphere. 
and you can see that Art Brighton developed disturbances and then subsequently westward and poleward expansion and how can I say politely, all hell breaks loose in the Aurora. And if you're lucky enough to be underneath it, you'll get a beautiful uh, display of the Northern Lights. So how can our ground magnetometers, for example, in combination with these all sky images and in combination with in situ monitoring, tell us about uh, some of the processes that might be important. So I'm gonna focus in on this question around expansion phase onset. Um, and the MI coupling that might be going on at that critical time uh, in advance of the development of the full expansion phase, the westward surge, poleward expansion, and so on that you just saw in the movie. So, of course, waves can give you a way to understand that MI coupling and the projection of those disturbances on the ionosphere. Um, and these are typically irregular waveforms pulsation P irregular waveform I in different wave bands. And so PI2s, which have become synonymous with substorm onset of waves in the 42nd to 152nd band, according to the Jacobs et al classification. And we've shown in some recent work that these waves are, um, behave differently in different wave bands. So the PI2s are known to have characteristics that point for example, to the center of the substorm current wedge, which develops during the expansion phase associated with um, the development of these new substorm current systems post onset. Um, I mean, there's a good physical reason for that, that that I won't talk about here, which is that the field aligned currents themselves need to be established by the propagation of alpha and waves and bouncing alpha and waves in the form of these PI2s are part of the signature those that establish the field aligned currents that you can see with uh, networks of these uh, ground instruments. So um, here's a nice schematic again, a kale uh, schematic from the University of Alberta. And I'm gonna show a, a comparison of how you can identify the epicenter of the onset by using kind of a, a lagged uh, technique across a ground network of stations to see when does this disturbance field arrive at different locations. And it works nicely. You can use discrete wavelets to understand how that works. And it supplements the classic PI2 analysis that's been done for, for several decades. So this is an example actually from a, a paper by Ray et al in 2009, using a discrete wavelet approach and identifying the power of brother specific threshold at this station SNKQ and then following its lagged evolution across the continent to these other stations with a lagged interpolation across, um, across the, the continent. And you can do this in different wave bands. As I mentioned, this is the 24 to 96 band that's kind of, at least according to these authors, somewhere between the classic PI2 band and the higher frequency PI1 band. But actually, you can see as you analyze this further, um, Ray et al. have done this in 2017, and Andy Smith has done this more recently in some nice papers that are out in JGR in 2020. And um, not only can you do this from the ground, but you can also do this uh, in space and try to piece together some idea of the connectivity or otherwise of the disturbances that are seen in the equatorial magnetosphere, for example, by the Themis probes and by the ionosphere um, at the footpoint of the relevant fuel lines. So this is a nice technique that's been established by these works that allow you to identify the epicenter uh, in the ionosphere, at least from a wave perspective of the beginnings, the very beginnings of expansion phase onset in advance of the release of the westward traveling surge in these other large scale auroral dynamics. And one of the characteristics that it turns out that they're associated with is the production of these auroral beads that are seen uh, along the onset arc in, a, a, turns out now, a large number of cases. So Calmoni et al. and authors in 2017 have shown that these beads that have been known, I guess, since the sort of 2006, 2008 epoch uh, in a number of arcs associated with substorm onset actually are there in the vast, vast majority of substorms, once one looks carefully at the modulation depth of the arc intensities. 
So these are really um, a feature that's uh, integral, in my opinion, to the substance sequence. And they're not just an occasional curiosity. I believe that they're a characteristic of the processes going on at onset. And they're an ionospheric signature of some of the onset physics in the equatorial plane, in my personal view. So you can piece together some of these dynamics. Uh, and Rea in 2009 argued actually that this is evidence in this particular substorm of a near Earth onset that precedes some of the dynamics in the tail and the subsequent release of energy and reconnection. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that that's um, at the point where we can say confidently that that's always the case. Um, I think we need to be careful about resolution all the time, especially in space when we look at this. Um, but there are cases I believe where it's fairly clear that it appears that there's near earth disturbances that play a role in, in the substorm. And again, personally, I'm kind of agnostic as to when it comes in the sequence. I'd just like to know how it works. How does the MI coupling work connecting this kind of near earth transition region uh, down into the ionosphere to explain the Akasufu kind of auroral um, sequence. So in this event, um, just to kind of provide some more perspective, there's two kiograms here. This is from SNKQ, which as you saw, I think in the previous slide, if I go back, is the station where you have the PI onset beginning the epicenter in the ionosphere. And you can see the start of these um, beads in this uh, kiogram. And uh, then the poleward expansion of this disturbance in the kiogram in the SNKQ longitude. Further west, you see the disturbance at Gillam, and it starts much later with these characteristics following the release of the surge. So this illustrates perfectly that the lat long disturbances in the ionosphere do have a characteristic sequence and it matters where you look because they're spatially and temporally um, non-uniform. There are propagation delays in the optics and in the bays. And here's the Delta Bs in the kind of filtered relevant bands. And you can see the SNKQ blue power picking up here, um, characteristic of the onset as characterized by the wavelets on the ground. And then these are the kind of DWT, the disgraced Greek wavelet powers turning on at SNKQ first and then later at Gillam as the disturbance expands um, uh, optically to some degree into that sector. And then this is the response at geosynchronous. So these features that are happening um, at SNKQ, uh, which again is the west of, of uh, I guess that's not true. It's the east of Hudson's Bay on that little island. And you can see the characteristic that goes 12 here, that the, the dipolarization is characterized by the change in angle and the change in the parallel component of the field in the goes uh, spacecraft coordinates. It's a little bit later than these very initial signatures right at the beginning of the expansion phase. So I believe these PI waves, PI1, PI12, and PI2, are actually a very powerful uh, sensor of what's happening in the MI system in the very first uh, seconds, tens of seconds and minutes around the beginning of the expansion phase. And they're telling us something important about the physics that's going on in the equatorial plane. So let me see if I can play this movie quickly since, uh, so this is in the supplementary material for that paper, um, Ray Atal's paper in 20, uh, 2009. And so this is a focus on two of these all sky images. This is the moon, so ignore it. And you can see these beads developing here. And then this is a difference movie that Jonathan put together. And so you can see how these arcs are evolving um, by looking at the difference. So red and blue are either like new arc emissions or the departure of arc emissions. And so you get a picture of the dynamical behavior in the difference movie. And um, I don't know if I can drag this back to the beginning here. And so this red line is following, I need to go earlier, I need to still go earlier there. Right at the beginning, you can just about start to see characteristics in this PI band as the very first signatures come in on the onset arc. 
of these beads, which then subsequently you can see them actually all propagating beautifully westward and then being swallowed up by the release of the westward traveling surge as it develops. So there's really nice um, MI coupling physics here being probed by the waves. And just because I can't resist it, here's another movie of the same event. Again, this is um, kind of Jonathan Ray's magic uh, together with Andy Kale from some time ago. And um, this contour is showing you the um, propagation of the PI1 disturbance across the continent. And if I play it again, you can see that that disturbance propagation appears in this case at least to, uh, it's connected to those beads, but it precedes the development of the westward surge in the auroral arcs, which is pretty interesting. So it's giving you a magnetic sensing of this disturbance environment in addition to disturbances that are large enough to give you an optical signature in the ionosphere. And just to continue the gratuity here, here's another representation of the same thing, um, just on a larger scale on a picture of the Earth. So. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty neat. So now I'm not going to go into all the details, but the, the these disturbances appear to be wave band dependent. So the picture that you see of the lags depends which frequency band that you look in. And I think that's also telling you about different processes um, that are going on in this coupled MI system in terms of which wave disturbances might be associated with which physics. And um, certainly there's wave disturbances associated with these beads and with the propagation of these beads that you saw in the movie. And I personally am of the opinion that these very early PI12 disturbances are connected to the onset of the bead disturbances and whatever is causing them in the equatorial plane of the magnetosphere and their signatures being seen on a, a, an alphanic propagation time down to the ionosphere, including the structuring of the arcs that I think tells you about what's happening in the equator. And so this is a, 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 a figure from Andy Smith's a very recent paper that actually was just accepted in, in JGR. And um, I, I won't talk about it in detail, but there's a, a host of information that one can derive from looking at these different disturbances uh, at the Themis spacecraft in situ, for example, as well as on the ground and seeing how they lag. And so this is a nice figure showing you the lag relative to the onset station here, which was Gillam in this 93 second band, uh, and then basically looking at the delays. And what you see is that the very short period stuff appears to be, in my view, more confined along a constant longitude, whereas the uh, more PI2-like stuff penetrates down to lower latitudes into the suboral zone. And I think that's historically why they've been used for timing. The substorm is that you can see them at mid lats without some of the complication of the auroral currents that are existing at higher latitudes in the auroral zone. So um, you see, I'm kind of uh, running out of time here a little bit. And I did want to talk about ULF wave radiation belt dynamics. So let me kind of um, skip through quickly some of these um, topics. And of course, uh, any of you can review the, the slides uh, afterwards as well, um, once uh, Kyle and colleagues have posted them online. So these waves um, can be a tracer of energy into energetic particle distributions by looking for the smoking gun of coherent interactions. And then if you average over them stochastically, then one can look at the long time scale dynamics, um, which are often done in a diffusive paradigm by phase averaging over the characteristics of waves um, with different frequency and wave number spectrum over longer times. And I'll mention briefly a, a different kind of wave mode, uh, cyclotron instability with ions, which can also be uh, Doppler shifted into resonance with radiation belt electron dynamics. And maybe they're uh, an elusive loss of radiation belt electrons, and they can also be monitored from the ground. So um, I don't really know if I want to play this movie, but uh, what the hell? So the, the, the picture to have in your mind is to, to take measurements from these ground networks of the disturbance fields 
and then to perhaps combine them with in situ measurements from spacecraft, for example, um, the two radiation belt storm probes in the Van Allen probes mission, and to compare what's measured in the plasma in situ with what's seen on the ground. And one of the important aspects of this is that the spacecraft only see what's going on um, if they're carrying plasma packages and wave packages in their own vicinity. So if there are waves in the vicinity of the spacecraft, then you would be able to see them. Um, but of course, an electron, for example, in the MEV energy range that's drifting around the Earth like that green dot there, uh, will sample disturbances from around its entire drift orbit. And so just because the spacecraft are in one location, they don't have to be in the preferred location for wave energy. And so they might miss the waves actually in situ uh, and still see the modulation effects locally in the particle distributions. But by combining data from ground arrays, one can piece that um, together. Uh, and that's actually even worse for electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves because they're often confined to very narrow L shells in space. And so unless the spacecraft sits in that narrow L shell, then you ain't gonna see it. And I'll show you a quick example of that. Um, so I think I'm gonna skip that movie in the interests of, of time. And so the basic idea is that um, the rate of change of particle energy W uh, in the radiation belt, so the ring current, will come from energy changes associated with the work done by the fields. And we typically focus on the electric fields and the work done by the electric fields on these drifting um, particle populations. And uh, if one uh, expands this into a diffusive paradigm, quite often there's a um, preponderance of phase space density of electrons available at high L. And in the diffusive paradigm, that could be transported inwards and by conserving the first invariant, that would also correspond to the energization of the particles as you conserve mu. Uh, and so the diffusive paradigm averages over these things uh, to produce a, a kind of a stochastic, if you will, transport equation. So just to quickly go over the physics, this is a very old movie of Scott Elkington's that uh, he kindly gave to me um, many years ago, probably about 10 now, if not more, but I quite like it. So here's a drifting electron in a fluctuating field, and you can look at the rate at which work is done on that particle by the field. And if they're in resonance such that it comes back and sees the same field at the same time, then you get a nice coherent response and, um, an overall net energy gain. And if they're out of resonance, then you get some energy parts of the interaction and then you lose some and then you gain some and you lose some and then you gain some. And the overall integrated effect is basically nothing. So even these diffusive elements, in my view, are well described by averaging over kind of resonant interaction between the particles, even if they're being phase scattered. And I guess that there's been some long evidence from, from the ground that ULF wave power is indeed connected to radiation belt dynamics. Uh, and this is a picture from a GRL from 2000 from, from Rod Mathy and I, and I'll just focus on the top panel here and the second one. So this is ULF wave power on the ground and the solar wind speed. So the solar wind speed is a strong controller of this ULF wave power on the ground. And then if you ask what it does to the electrons, then quite often, Again, I don't know if you can see my pointer here, that um, the wave power goes up and then a day or two later, there's a characteristic rise in the um, electron flux. And you can argue about the causality of that relationship, but um, they're, they're definitely strongly connected. So you can probe these interactions using coherent waves. And this is an example from my paper in 2013. Although Mike Hartinger just published a very nice discussion about um, why you don't see very many of these coherent interactions that just came out in 2020. But here's an unfiltered, I emphasize unfiltered ground magnetometer trace, 800 nanoteslas here on the ground. Um, so this is basically the, the raw data. It looks like it came out of a signal generator. Um, it didn't, it's a magnetospheric disturbance measured on the ground and then modulation seen at geosynchronous by Los Alamos vehicles, and also in this epoch by the Cress spacecraft. 
Um, we believe this is a, a drift resonance and there's a similar characteristics of being in the Van Allen probes. This is, um, for example, a, an interval studied by Seth Claude Pierre recently with Van Allen probe data showing again evidence for these um, coherent resonances. Now, if you average these over um, many, many waves, one can establish a diffusive paradigm. And to cut to the chase quickly, one needs to characterize the diffusion coefficients and some element of loss. And in this simple 1D diffusion equation, one can characterize transport inwards or outwards, depending on the profile of this phase-based density. Uh, either from magnetic compressional disturbances or from electric disturbances. And if you wanted to, you could even include some level of energy dependence in these um, criteria. And you can do this electrically from the ground with ground magnetometer data by mapping the disturbance fields into space. And there've been a number of attempts to do this. And um, I think I'll just skip over these. Um, this is a paper from 2016 trying to explain Baker's third radiation belt. The data is in the top two panels, uh, L star versus time, in the three and five MeV channels. And these are the results from a radial diffusion simulation with some loss in the middle and then turning off all loss in the bottom from wave particle interactions. And it seems that the transport outwards in this interval can explain the third belt, although that remains a controversial um, conclusion. I believe it's correct, but others have a different view. Um, and you can simulate a number of storms. So Lewis had a paper that just came out, Lewis Oziki this year, looking at the 2013 storm uh, and also looking at the 2015 storm. I won't go into the details. As you start to add some level of wave particle complexity in this 2015 storm, for example, some the MIC waves at low L, then what you can do is to correct perhaps your diffusion only simulation to get better agreement with the observations in the left panel and the simulations in the right panel. But even in the absence of these um, plasma wave particle interactions, just with inward and outward diffusion, the morphology of the belts can be quite well predicted just from the diffusive transport, although I wouldn't, complain, wouldn't claim so that's the only thing that's um, going on. Um, and finally, just to touch on these emic waves, here's a, a, an example of the problem with looking for emic waves with satellites. So the, the top panel is showing you uh, power spectral density as a function of time in the one to two hertz range, I guess not to two hertz range, over three hours from, from Van Allen probe B and Van Allen probe A. Um, one's outbound and one's inbound. And this blob here is an emic wave. Um, and you can see it here as a left-hand polarized disturbance. But when you look on the ground underneath this, the emic waves are banging along for hours at a time. So they're clearly there for a long period of time. But unfortunately, if you're trying to look for them with um, an elliptically orbiting satellite like the Van Allen probes, then you only see them on the L shells where that wave is being captured. And they're seen on the ground, of course, for much longer periods, aided or indeed complicated by the fact that there's some ducting. And Maria Yusanova and others have looked at the effects of these emic waves on radiation belt electrons and found good evidence that a Doppler shifted resonance can snip out some of the lower pitch angle particles. Um, so you'd have to go read this paper, but these dots are basically, are there emic waves on the ground or not uh, from ground instrumentation? And you can see there's a nice correspondence between the times that there are emic waves and the narrowing of these pitch angle distributions eating out the lower pitch angle particles, um, but not in this interval, at least having much of an effect on the trapped 90 degree particles. So I think my time is probably up uh, I wanted to talk about cross phase and the ideas of remote sensing density, um, but I, I'll skip through that. The idea is essentially by looking at the properties of the waves, one can invert this into a measure of the uh, ambient mass density that one is propagating through here and to follow the Grabowski dynamics of the plasmasphere. And um, I guess a Carpenter and Anderson's erosion of the plasmasphere and then its refilling can actually be monitored uh, as it was with the image spacecraft mission, also using networks of ground magnetometers. 
Uh, and this is shown here, for example, just look at this panel. This is L shell uh, as a function of inferred mass density. Here's a depleted plasma pores. You see the density deplete. And then this is the mass density inferred from the ground in red. And actually it even infers that there might be a heavy ion population just outside the plasma pores associated with a heavy ion torus. And many authors have looked at uh, using that. So let me finish here a, a little bit over time. So thanks everybody for the, the attention. I hope this demonstrates that ground mag data is useful. Um, please think about using it. If you've got questions about anything in this talk, um, then please feel free to get in touch. I think the key in all of this is that, that these alvenic disturbances that get excited because of their field uh, propagation characteristics make these ground networks especially powerful for doing a kind of um, remote sensing of the environment along field lines. And in my view, that's why this actually even works at all. It's because of the plasma physics of the alvenic interaction. And I'll leave up my uh, acknowledgements to funding agencies and also to the many people I've collaborated with over the years, and some of whom uh, I've used research materials here and apologies to anybody whose stuff that uh, I didn't include. So thank you for, for your attention. And thanks again to the organizers for organizing this uh, seminar series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yan. This was very interesting, very clear. So people can still posting questions in our chat box. Uh, we have one question for Vanya Jordanova on the, when you were talking about the PI1 and PI2 examples. Are there are the large DBDT disturbances associated with the convection also associated with the storm development? So with so I could open the chat, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the incidences there looked like it might have been associated with the propagation of disturbances from a substorm activation that then kind of made its way along the flanks. Now, that might suggest that there's um, convective flow being released in these non-stationary um, convective transport from the, the closure of tail flux. And of course, that that would be expected and you would know much better than me, Vanya, about uh, what that looks like in, in global um, models. My, my gut feeling is that, that maybe that there's a, a relationship to the, the possible convective signals on the flanks that are released by uh, substorm light dynamics in the tail, but it, it doesn't seem to be the whole story. It, it looks like the addition of flux into the tail from day side reconnection also apparently has a strong convective DBDT signature uh, on the flanks. And so probably both are important. Which is the most important? I honestly don't know right now, partly because I don't really know kind of what the physics is that's coupling those uh, convection link disturbances down into the ionosphere to give you those DBDTs. And the waves that you saw in the SuperMag video are much longer period, certainly than PI1s. And they're, they're more of these large scale sort of, maybe you would say PC5 and even above type disturbances, but certainly in the PC5 range appears to be the, the, the scale, possibly even longer period for some of those disturbances. Okay, thank you. And I saw Karine has her uh, hand up. She wants to unmute and ask a question on the comment, please. Yeah, thank you. sorry, it was a little bit long to write it on the chat. Uh, hi, no problem. Uh, Jan. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's a question regarding uh, again the the uh, the flank excitation. Um, I've got in fact two questions. Uh, is your uh, interpretation just linked to uh, the location of uh, the excitation re relative to the flank, or is there any other solar wind parameter? that uh, make you think that there was a, a nice excitation of the flank? So first question. And the second, apparently I've seen uh, a, 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 an asymmetry between dusk and down excitation. Is it what you expect or is it just casual in that uh, specific case? So, so to answer the, the, the first question, it seems like strongly southward IMF is very important. So those disturbances, there's another almost uh, carbon copy actually of the March dynamics in the September 2017 storm. 
And, you know, if you took the dates off, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you, it would be, I won't say indistinguishable, but they're remarkably similar in terms of the way that they develop. And so you see the strongest signals during periods of southward IMF from what we can tell. Um, that there are disturbances on both flanks. Um, if you look at that Supermag movie, then one of the problems is that, um, uh, especially in that kind of 13 UT, 14 UT interval, where you saw all of that crazy dynamics on the kind of the right hand side of the screen there on the dawn flank, um, the coverage of magnetometers on the other side of the earth is pretty sparse. So it's a little bit difficult to see if you're just missing something big because the coverage is not good enough or if it's a genuine asymmetry. Um, there is evidence that it's active on both flanks, um, especially from the September 2017 event. Now, whether there's a, a preference on one flank or the other, um, I don't know. I started to wonder about this myself and, and I was wondering about whether there's a role for um, you know, electrons that are injected from the night side, which would tie into Vanya's question about the tail, about whether some of those injected electrons as they drift into the dawn side, if they're scattered to the ionosphere, might actually change the conductivity there in the ionosphere and play a role in kind of enhancing this MI coupling or changing the conductance in the ionosphere um, to make the ground DBDT much larger um you know under a fixed kind of driving whether that would increase the the, the delta b on the ground so the, the the short answer is that's a great question i don't fully know the 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 answer um the, the, there is some evidence i think in statistical studies that there, there might be more ground magnetic disturbance on the dawn flank but i'd have to go back and dig into the literature about that and be nice if it was connected to energetic particle scattering into the into the ionosphere and changing conductance seems feasible to me but um we would need to go away and uh, and look at it more carefully but it's a that's a really interesting question okay thank you so uh any anybody else Mm. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you, Professor Just Jan. fine, Marcus, by the way. So, uh, this was our last talk of this year. So, we thank you all for attendance. Thank you all for the speakers. Uh, we'll have our short break for AGU, as you all guys know, and holidays. And we will will resume on January 11, when John Lyon will discuss in global MEHD simulations. So thank you all again, and have a wonderful AGU and holiday season. Thank you. Thanks everybody, thank you, stay Jan. safe out there. Thanks guys again for the invitation, much appreciated.